Hello, my name is Jonathan DeKeel. Today, our group, Empire Engineering, will be presenting our Cajalco Road Dam project, benefiting the needs of the local mining companies in Corona, California. In our presentation, we will first review our project background and problem statement. Following this, we will analyze our reservoir capacity based on client demand and recommend a site location. We will then proceed into the design aspects of the project, starting with the dam. Then, we will discuss the spillway design, followed by the outlet works. Afterwards, hydraulic design aspects will be presented including the pipeline system, pump station, and water tanks. Then, we will analyze the road design. Environmental, sustainability, and constructability aspects will be discussed. Finally, our project estimate will be presented, followed by a conclusion. We will begin by discussing the project background, problem statement, and the purpose of our presentation. The project is located in the city of Corona, within Riverside County. Just west of Lake Matthews, the land used consists of open space, which is privately managed by the mining companies. Their operations require water for the mining of materials, and they currently rely on a groundwater reservoir for their water supply. This is the source of the problem, since their current groundwater reservoir is estimated to deplete within the next 10 years due to regulations and overuse. This will cause disruptions to their future mining operations. For these reasons, our team has been tasked to identify a reliable source of clean and non-potable water supply. This supply must meet all operational needs of the mining interests, such as dust control. The solution will involve the collection of watershed runoff supplemented by an imported water supply. Technical aspects have been considered and a full design will be provided for a new and accessible infrastructure for the collection, storage, and conveyance of non-potable water. We use the engineering design process to develop our solution. We begin by identifying the problem, followed by an analysis of possible constraints that may need to be addressed. This process allows for a development of alternatives to be evaluated. Since this project is made up of different groups, we use the Gantt chart to stay on schedule and ensure all work is completed. Finally, we choose one of the alternatives, design it, and then conclude the process by providing a cost estimate. However, if there are any concerns from our client, the process may repeat itself. We will now discuss our client demand and the ripple method. The ripple method is a graphical method used to optimize the reservoir capacity. We were given a demand of 54 million gallons per month. There will be two sources of water use, including a variable supply of runoff water and a constant supply of water purchased from the Metropolitan Water District. We will also be using runoff water data from 2012 to 2016. We can graph the cumulative inflow, which is the inflow of runoff water and the cumulative demand, which is the amount of demand supplyable from the inflow. From this, we can get the optimum reservoir capacity, which is the maximum vertical distance from the cumulative inflow and the demand line. This analysis results in a needed reservoir capacity of 159 million gallons. Based on this, 25 million gallons per month will be supplied from the reservoir with another 29.75 million gallons per month being purchased from the Metropolitan Water District. This will meet the client demands of 54.75 million gallons per month. Now I will begin by introducing the dam we used for this project. The dam that our team chose for this project is the embankment dam. Embankment dam are the most common type of dam for the following advantages. They are proven construction method, lower cost compared to other dams, local availability of suitable materials. They are made of rock fill or compacted soil to control permeability and seepage. The cross-section of the earthen dam for this project is slope of 3 is to 1 for the downstream and 2.5 is to 1 on the upstream. The crest length is 16 feet with the height of the dam 60 feet. The cumulative ground that has been removed in the project location was 42 cubic feet and the cumulative ground fill is 87,000 cubic feet. The black circle on the map indicates the vicinity where the dam site location is in respect to the surrounding fault lines. There are three major fault lines that are near the site. San Andreas, San Jacinto, and Alsnor. The Alsnor fault line is the closest to the project site, but least active with major seismic activity occurring every 250 years. The San Jacinto fault is in similar range with major seismic activity every 200 years. The most active of all three fault lines is the San Andreas fault with seismic activity occurring every 22 years. These fault lines vary in activity, but the most important aspect of each is the maximal probable magnitude they can produce. The Alcinor, San Jacinto, and San Andreas have probable magnitudes of 7.5 and 8 respectively. 
Since the Alcimer fault line is the closest to the project site, it will have the largest effect. The Alcimer fault line can potentially reach a horizontal ground acceleration of 0.6 gravity. The San Jacinto and San Andreas fault lines will also both produce horizontal ground accelerations of 0.3 gravity. In order to find the seismic values for the specific location on the dam, we use hazards by location. Using the bulleted information on the left-hand side of the slide, we are able to input the coordinates of the dam, the United States Building Code ASCE 7-16, risk category 3, and a site class of A, hard rock. Once these results were entered, hazards by location gave us values for our specified site that you can see on the table. The first two values displayed are the maximum considered earthquake short and long period ground motions. These were computed using graphical analysis displayed in the left-hand corner of this slide. Other values include site amplification factor, short and long modified spectral acceleration, and peak ground acceleration. Further calculations will be used for seismic forces using the values of modified peak ground acceleration, which has a total of 0 0.683 gravity. We will now discuss about the structure analysis of the earthen dam. This is to check the stability of the dam from overturning and sliding. As the picture in the slide shows the forces that are acting on the dam, which are hydrostatic force, hydrodynamic force, and uplift pressure acting on the bottom of the dam. Also, we consider the seismic force on the dam, both vertical and horizontal in our calculations. The friction force is considered, which prevents the dam from sliding. We divided the dam into three parts for our weight calculations. We considered one right angle triangle on the upstream and one left angle triangle on the downstream and a middle crest length part. This table shows the area in feet square, weight kept per feet of the dam and the moment calculations. The, some of the parameters that are used in our analysis are the friction coefficient mu 0.6 for the friction force applied on the dam, peak ground acceleration, which is 0.853, weight of the water 62.4 pound per feet cube, weight of the earth 110 pound per feet cube, and uplift force applied on the dam, which is around 3,300 PSF. The required forces upon the dam listed below were calculated with the respective equation. Starting with the friction, the force is calculated by multiplying mu times the total weight of the dam. Due to being a sliding force, there is no moment occurring. For the hydrostatic force, we multiply one half times the weight of the water times the height of the dam squared. For hydrodynamic force, we multiply the coefficient factor times the hydrostatic force previously calculated. Seismic force was calculated by multiplying the total weight of the dam times peak ground acceleration. Lastly, the uplift force was calculated by multiplying the length of the dam times the uplift pressure. The moment for all forces was calculated force times distance. As you can see, all of the values are provided in the table below. Based on the analysis of all the forces, we proceed calculating the factor of safety for sliding and overturning. All minimum requirements provided in the table below were gathered from the dam safety department. For the overturning calculations, we use the restraining moment over the overturning moment. And for the safety factor of sliding, we use the restraining force over the sliding forces. As you can see in the bottom chart, factor of safety was calculated both with and without seismic consideration. Slope stability refers to the stability of earthen fills or materials in a slope and determining whether it will fail. For this analysis, we use a simplified Bishop's method to determine the factor of safety of possible slopes for the dam. The method consists of drawing the slope. In this figure, it would be the 3 to 1 slope and its slip surface. The slip surface is created by sweeping a line within a radius. Within the slip surface, parts are sectioned off. The figure below was drawn in the AutoCAD software. The following parameters are determined per section, such as the width and cohesion. Furthermore, those parts for each section are inserted into the equation shown. The factors of safety for each slope is displayed as 1.95 for 3 to 1, 1.55 for 2.5 to 1, and 1.34 for 2 to 1. The slopes of 3, 2 to 1, and 2.5 to 1 are preferred as it meets the minimum desired factor of safety of 1.5. We then use the finite element analysis program, CW, to analyze a 2D cross-section of our dam. From the geotech report, we know we have bedrock 10 feet below the surface from our hydraulics team, we were given the height of our dam shall be 60 feet. From our structural team, we were given the downstream slope shall be three to one, and upstream slope shall be two and a half to one. After conducting our analysis, we found that our dam shall be made of 
sand or fill, the on-site material slash clay, and a blanket drain. We found that our dam shall have an impervious score with slopes 0 0.25 to 1 from the top of the dam to the bedrock. This means we will excavate 10 feet below the existing surface. We found that our dam shall have a blanket drain that shall be five feet below the existing surface and shall be a total of 93 feet with 10 feet of the drain past the toe of the dam. The components for the design can be seen in the right image displaying the dam's cross section. The proposed dam's components include the following. We will begin with the impervious clay core located in the middle. The impervious clay core's function is to hold the free water of the dam's reservoir and to resist the seepage water pressure. Next will be the upstream and downstream shells with permeable standard fill. The permeable shell support and protect the clay core. The upstream pervious shell affords stability against rapid drawdown and the downstream pervious shell acts as a drain control for the seepage to direct the water flow into the blanket drain. The blanket drain is located near the downstream toe of the earthen dam and its purpose is to intercept any water traveling through porous soils so that the water does not surface downstream of the embankment. The crest is the most upper part of the dam, which divides the upstream and downstream shells, and its objective is to give access to vehicles along the roadway. Experiencing some degree of seepage is normal for embankment dams. However, if left uncontrolled, it can potentially result in dam failure. Therefore, a buried blanket drain composed of sand and gravel was chosen to be the best option to collect the seepage and to control any internal erosion problems. The under drain has a thickness of five feet, a length of 93 feet, and will be placed at a distance, one third of the foundation area on the downstream portion of the dam. The under drain, along with the clay core, are there to keep the downstream side of the embankment dry so that the dam can function properly. Test results have shown that the under drain also acts in conjunction with the core to help lower the phreatic line, which will allow the seepage to reach the under drain as quickly as possible. This will also help to reduce the pore water pressure inside the embankment, which will increase the stability of the downstream slope against sliding. Monitoring the seepage being piped out of the under drain is also essential to prevent potential dam failure. Collected seepage of approximately 10 cubic feet per day from the dam under drain will be discharged in Cahalco Creek. When the collected seepage is discharged downstream, and if the soil is not saturated, the water will seep into the ground. However, if needed, monitoring instruments, such as a piezometer and weir, can be installed to determine if the seepage condition is in a steady or changing state. Piezometers are capable of measuring pour water pressure and water level, and weirs are capable of measuring flow rate and leakage. SeepW software allows for groundwater flow modeling and analysis in porous media given set boundary conditions. With its set boundary condition, SeepW will run its analysis. Table 1 outlines the hydraulic conductivity in centimeters per second of the materials to be 10 to the negative 1 for the blanket drain, 10 to the negative 5 for the on-site material slash clay, and 10 to the negative 3 for standard fill. This is shown in figure 1. The dashed line in figure 2 is the line of zero pressure, also known as the phreatic line. It is the representation of a piezometric line or water table. The large drop in the zero pressure line within the core indicates that much of the potential energy is dissipated in the core. In fact, water is entering the core at 55 feet ahead and exiting the core at two and a half feet ahead. In conclusion, SeepW's results demonstrate that the seepage is 0.0635 feet cubed per day per linear foot. This is approximately 10 cubic feet per day. Next, we have the Open Shoe Spillway. The spillway is located on the south side of the dam and is designed to be a reinforced rectangular concrete channel. The functionality of the spillway is to discharge excess water that is stored in the dam into the Cahoco Creek. For the hydraulic assessment of the spillway, we evaluated the flow conditions at the spillway crest. The downstream phase with a 3 to 1 slope and at the bottom is the energy dissipator. The spillway capacity is based on 40 years of historical data of Tamasco Canyon Creek was found in the USGS website and used to calculate the capacity of the spillway. The highest peak flow recorded was at 6,140 cubic feet per second, and since the project is on Cahalco Creek, half of the peak flow in Tabasco Canyon Creek was used as the spillway capacity, which results in designing a spillway with a capacity of 3,070 cubic feet per second. At the approach of the spillway located on the crest, the flow is critical. The critical depth is calculated to adequately determine the base of the channel. To avoid increasing the height of the dam and additional material costs, 
it was determined that the optimal critical depth of flow must remain around or below 3 feet. An open channel flow analysis was conducted to determine the adequate base width to maintain critical depth around 3 feet. Through various iterations, a 100 feet base was determined to satisfy this criteria. To determine the critical depth of water, Manny's equation is rearranged to solve for the geometric properties for a rectangular channel. In doing so, multiple iterations were calculated, which resulted in finding a supercritical depth of the water to be 0.635 feet and incoming velocity of 48.35 feet per second. Next is energy dissipation. The conjugate method considers the depth before the hydraulic jump and the tailwater depth. By using the conjugate method and the specific energy equation, the required energy dissipation was found. First, by using the conjugate method, the tailwater depth was determined. Then the specific energy was determined for the supercritical section and for the tailwater section. The difference between these energies resulted in the required energy dissipation. The graph presented on the right represents the relationship between the depth of flow on the y-axis and the specific energy on the x-axis. By plotting the supercritical depth of water and the tailwater depth, their corresponding energies were verified and the difference in energies is the expected energy loss. Next, basin configuration. Based on the supercritical incoming flow properties, a basin configuration from the Bureau of Reclamation's design of small dams was selected. A type three basin configuration was selected based on the flow conditions, Freud's number being greater than 4.5 and an incoming velocity of less than or equal to 60 feet per second. The energy dissipation basin is essential to prevent cavitation, erosion, and the structural and any structural failures of the spillway or dam. By evaluating for its number and the incoming supercritical velocity, the recommended component measurements were determined using the typical schematic of the type three basin, as we saw in the slide before, and the empirical graphs from the Bureau of Reclamation's Design of Small Dams Manual. The basin consists of shoe blocks, baffle piers, and a sloped end sill. The measurements of these components appear small, but when compared to the incoming depth of flow, which is less than a foot, they are adequately sized. Following similar recommendations as before, the length of the ceiling basin was determined to be 25 feet long, with a spacing between the first two components of 7.4 feet. The channel cross sections were determined for each section of the spillway by calculating the freeboard in each section. The freeboard is a function of the flow velocity and the flow depth. The channel wall height is determined by adding the freeboard and the flow depth. All three sections maintain a 100 foot base width. For the critical section, we recommend a six foot wall. For the supercritical, a four foot wall. And lastly, for the basin, we recommend a 12 foot wall to account for the hydraulic jump. And to conclude the hydraulic assessment of the spillway and to aid in the design of the channel walls, the water surface profiles were drawn for each section. At the top of the spillway, the slope is horizontal, and with a critical depth of 3.08 feet, the water surface curve produced is an H2 curve at the critical point. At the steepest section, normal depth is less than the critical depth of flow, so our curve transitions from an H2 to an S2 curve. And lastly, when the slope transitions from steep to mild, a hydraulic jump will occur, and only one of the two water surface curves are generated, either an S1 or an M3. And in this section, the normal depth is greater than the critical depth. Now we will talk about structural analysis of the spillway. In determining the thickness of the chute spillway, which, which we chose in, in our project, we referenced the textbook hydrology on hydraulics system that gave us an estimated of 12 to 18 inches of thickness. When we were calculating for the spillway thickness, we considered soil pressure, hydrostatic, and seismic to find the critical, supercritical, and basin. The formula that we used was one half times the density times the height squared. This formula follows the same for soil and seismic. The density that was used for water was 62.4 pounds per cubic foot, and for the soil is 110 pounds per cubic foot. Same for seismic. After we calculate our forces to determine the moment, we do force times distance. Based on the force and moment calculations shown in the previous slide of the hydrostatic force, soil pressure, seismic force for the left and the right side retaining wall for the spillway and the uplift pressure on the basin. Based on the ACI 318-14, we check the two minimum requirements for the area of the steel. After we calculate the area of the steel from ASTM standard, we found that number of rebars and how many are used. We check the demand and capacity ratio. In this slide, the first one is a cross section for both critical and supercritical as they are on the same height, which has two number four rebars. The next one is the cross section of basin, which has a height of 12 feet uses four number six rebars. 
And the last one is the base of the spillway, which is 100 feet, which is constant through the spillway channel as the six number nine reverse. After the structure analysis, we determined that 12 inch thick concrete can be used for the spillway. Next, we will be discussing the outlet works. The outlet works is critical for the emergency release of the reservoir in the event that significant damage or failure should occur to the dam. It is also required for operational use to convey water to the pump station. The proposed structure is an incline reinforced concrete intake tower since it provides more stability over a vertical tower, is best for high seismic risk areas, and is easier to maintain and access. The incline tower's relative location can be seen in the figure to the right as the green segment along the left canyon wall. According to the Division of Safety of Dams, a reservoir storing 5,000 acre feet or less of water must be drained to 50% of its capacity within seven to 10 days, and must be 100% empty within 20 to 30 days. To meet drawdown requirements, the discharge rates were determined for the proposed 488 acre foot reservoir. The first seven to 10 days are the most critical since it poses the highest safety risk in an emergency situation. Therefore, the discharge rate criteria should meet the required 12.3 cubic feet per second. The following configuration was determined to satisfy the discharge criteria. Various orifice openings were placed in five foot incremental levels with respect to the reservoir floor up to the maximum water level. Each orifice intake is spaced 10 feet apart on each side of the concrete shaft in a staggered pattern. This ensures that regardless of water levels, the discharge rates can always be met. Orifice openings were sized with a one foot diameter and the discharge was assessed using the orifice discharge equation. The discharge was then determined for a hydraulic head difference ranging from five feet to 55 feet and the resulting maximum discharge was 45.8 cubic feet per second and a minimum of 6.17 cubic feet per second which well exceeds the discharge criteria of 12.3 cubic feet per second. Since the intake tire will be designed on a hill, a slope stability analysis is crucial for design considerations. Assuming that the soil profile is homogeneous and cohesion with soil with a unit weight of 120 pounds per cubic foot with a friction angle of 32 degrees, we can run an analysis using GeoStudio's slope W software. Initially, the piezometric line for the water surface is established, which you can see on the picture on the right hand side represented by the blue line. The slip surface is defined by the green zone, which uses an iteration of 39 slices taken 100 times to determine the critical slip surface. Using the Bishop method for the slope stability analysis on the existing ground conditions, it was determined that the factor of safety for the slip condition was 1.49. Another analysis was done showing an increase in slope resulted in a higher factor of safety. The picture on the left-hand side displays the location of the incline intake tower with respect to the reservoir floor. Now we will discuss about the structure analysis of the intake tower. The structure is made of reinforced concrete with shear keys at the bottom of the structure. The outer dimension of the structure is 10 feet by 10 feet and the interior part is 8 feet by 8 feet. The total length of the downslope is 335 feet. The dimensions of the shear key is 5 feet in depth, 1 feet in thickness and width is 10 feet. The spacing from each shear key to shear key is 20 feet and the total shear key is used in structure 17. This slide shows the shear key reinforcement in the intake tower. Based on the ACI 318-14, we did the moment calculations based on the hydrostatic force and seismic force applied on the intake tower and found the required area of the steel. As per our calculations, we use bundle of two number 14 rebars of the shear key, which is shown in the slide. Now we will be transitioning into the pipeline system. The pipeline alignment shown here in the plan view shows that our pipe network is laid out along the side of the Eagle Canyon Road. The pipeline begins at the outlet tower and comes around to the dam. And then it is connected to the pump station and lastly connected to the water tanks. The design team selected a ductile iron pipe that is cement mortar lined. The pipe is 18 inch internal diameter from the pump station to the water tank and 36 inch internal diameter from the outlet tower to the pump station. The pipe design uses the Bernoulli equation to find the optimum balance between the velocity, diameter, and head pump to find the correct pumps for a client's needs. The velocity and diameter had to fall under certain parameters to prevent damage to the pipe system and to reduce the overall cost of the project. The trench depth would be at 3 feet plus the outer diameter of the pipe of 19.5 inches outer diameter to be a total of 4.625 feet for the depth and 3 feet for the width. The pipeline will be buried along the side of the Eagle Canyon Road. 
and it will be utilizing an American Waterworks Association reference for a Type 3 trench with a loose soil backfill because the pipe will not be placed under a heavy loading or any vehicles. Now we will transition into pump station. As David Vo mentioned, we will use the Bernoulli equation to find the optimum balance between the velocity, diameter, and head pump. The calculated head pump was determined to be 256 feet, which converts to 216 horsepower. With the total head calculated, we identified the most advantageous pump system known as Gould's 3180 Heavy Duty Process Pump, which has a head pump up to 410 feet, which is within range of our calculated total head. There will be a total of two pumps. One will be backup, which will be linked in parallel to the first pump. A relief valve is included in the pump station to avoid any form of surge pressure. The picture shown in the left-hand side is the hydraulic coverage of our selected pump. The y-axis describes total head, which we calculated 256 feet. The x-axis represents the capacity of the pump, which is determined by the inflow per hour required to meet the demand of the client, which comes to a capacity of 3,333 GPM. Once we identify our x and y axis values, we will intersect to determine a pump model. The picture in the right-hand side shows where our pump station will be located. This slide shows a visual representation of our 3D rendering of our earthen dam site. There is an indication where our pump station is located. The concrete building will be manufactured by Butler Building Company. This structure will be housing one main pump and one emergency pump. The dimensions of the structure will be 20 feet long by 30 feet wide with a height of 15 feet. Lastly, the pump station will be operating nine hours a day, seven days a week. We will now talk about how we design the water storage tank. In order to find the tank capacity needed, one, the daily water buffer, and two, the fire water requirement needed to be calculated. Tank dimensions were then chosen based on the capacity and site constraints. The illustration above shows where the tanks will be located, which is north of the reservoir. A water buffer is needed in case hours of operation and water usage must be extended. The pump is expected to be pumping water into the tank from 6 a.m. to 3 p.m., while mining operations are expected to use water from the tank from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. The daily demand of the client is 1.8 million gallons. The flow rate into the tank is 200,000 gallons per hour for nine hours, and the flow rate out is 150,000 gallons per hour for 12 hours. These values can be seen on the graph where they were analyzed to find the maximum difference between the inflow and the outflow. The max difference can be seen highlighted as the green line with a difference of 450,000 gallons. This number is the daily water buffer. The United States Fire Administration firefighter requirement was also needed in order to calculate the tank capacity. Using the community area of the site, the following formula was used to calculate the firefighter requirement, which calculated to be 3.14 million gallons. By adding the 450,000 gallon buffer and the 3.14 million gallon firefighter requirement, the final tank capacity needed was found to be 3.59 million gallons. To support this capacity, the tank's dimensions calculated were 100 feet in diameter and 66 feet high. However, one singular tank would be too large to construct on the site because it could compromise the site's foundation and would not leave room for an access road to the tanks. To best support this capacity, our design includes two 100-foot diameter and 34-foot high tanks. Two smaller tanks are much easier to construct than one larger tank and more cost-effective to construct compared to several smaller tanks while also leaving space for a 20-foot wide access road, which will be placed between and around the tanks for vehicles to drive around for inspection. In order to analyze the water tank using TAP2000, we first needed to determine the load combination. The load combination for the water tank consisted of dead loads, water loads, and the greater of either seismic or wind loads. The total dead load of our tank depended on the amount of steel used for the cylindrical shell dome roof, and tank floor. Since there is 1,400 cubic feet of steel per tank, and the density of our steel is 490 PCF, the total dead load for the design is 700 kips. The rest of the loads were calculated using the American Water Works Association D100 standard. We first calculated the weight of the water on the lower part of the tank, which is the impulsive equation, and the weight of the water on the upper part of the tank due to sloshing, which is the convective equation. Our D, H, and W, T variables represent the diameter of the tank, depth of water in the tank, and weight of the water respectively. After calculating both equations, 
our total water load came up to just over 14,000 kits. Next, we calculated the seismic load for the tank, which was dependent on the impulsive and convective water weights from before. This time, we multiplied both weights by the spectral acceleration, and since the corresponding area for the impulsive water weight was slightly higher, the impulsive water weight force governs with a force of 56 kips. For our final wind loads, PW, we calculated the loads to be 17.36 PSF. However, since this equation provides a minimum design calculation, the wind load that we considered for our tanks was 18 PSF. This is calculated with a worst case scenario of wind speeds up to 95 miles per hour. These are the three loads we consider for a water tank design, dead, seismic, and water. These loads were used on SAP 2000 to determine whether or not the tank design would fail. One thing to note is that we did not consider wind loads since the seismic load was greater. We used SAP 2000 to analyze the design of the water tank that has a shell thickness of one fourth of an inch. The hydrostatic pressure was applied as a surface pressure up to Z equals 30 feet. And the seismic load was also applied as a surface pressure for half of the circumference of the water tank. We did the same process for another water tank that has a shell thickness of 3 eighths of an inch. We then ran both water tank designs and looked at the shear stress of the shell members. The first water tank design of thickness equals one fourth of an inch gave us a shear max of 29,791 PSI, which is greater than our allowable shear. The second water tank design of thickness equals 3 eighths of an inch gave us a shear max of 20,034 PSI which is less than our allowable shear. Because our allowable shear is 21,000 PSI, we decided to go with our second water tank design with the shell thickness of 3 eighths of an inch. This is the form, shape, and animation of our selected water tank design with a load combination of dead load plus earthquake plus hydrostatic pressure. For our foundation calculations, the team decided to use Vesic's equation, an ASD method of calculating shallow foundations. For our design parameters, we had no cohesion, a foundation depth of two feet, and our foundation would be a four foot thick ring foundation with no inclination factors, meaning, meaning our foundation would lay flat on the design surface. After calculating our nominal bearing capacity, we went on to calculate the allowable bearing capacity, which is our nominal divided by our factor of safety. Our allowable bearing capacity came out to be 6,396.25 pounds per square feet. From here, we decided, we, we went on to calculate our bearing pressure, which, which would be our, our max bearing pressure that our soil would be seeing. After calculating our max bearing pressure, it turned out to be 3,425 pounds per square feet. From here, we moved on to the final step in final foundation design check, in which we compare our allowable bearing capacity and our max bearing pressure. For our design, our allowable bearing capacity was greater than our max bearing pressure, meaning our foundation design would be good and would be able to withstand the water tank load. The foundation is a circular foundation consisting of a 100 foot diameter. The thickness of the slab that the tank sits on is 18 inches, consisting of a hexagonal shape for ease of constructability. The depth of the foundation is 4 feet below the ground. The thickness of the footing is 2 feet. The cross section of the entire foundation and close up of the foundation is depicted below. The anchor that we chose for this tank is a grade 36 adhesive anchor that will be 5 inches deep into the concrete slab. Each tank will have one anchor per foot per panel. With 16 panels per tank, that brings the total to 304 anchors per tank. And there are three roads that were designed in this project. The first road is the Dam Access Road, which is located north of Eagle Canyon Road and will allow access to the top of the dam. The second road is the Water Tank Access Road, which is also north of Eagle Canyon Road and will allow access to the water tanks. And the third road is the Intake Tower, Access Road, which is located next to Eagle Canyon Road and will allow access to the intake tower. One of the first steps in Civil 3D road design is creating what is called an assembly, which is essentially a cross-section of the road. Within this assembly, we define different components we will be using for our roads, such as the lane width, the total width, the shoulder width, and our cross slope. These road bases were determined by City of Corona Standard Plan 111 Private Way. As seen on the table to your right, we have a total width of 16 feet, a lane width of 12 feet, a shoulder width of 2 feet, and a cross slope of 2%. The cut and fill slope was defined as 2 to 1 per federal design standards. 
An illustration of these design specifications just mentioned can be seen towards our left. The next step is to create an alignment to create a layout for the road. After going over the road design specifications, we can start the design of the access road to the dam site. At the top, we have a profile view. Knowing the existing ground, we have a proposed alignment in a heavier line weight with a maximum slope of 14%. The figure on the bottom left illustrates a cross-sectional view of the road corridor. Again, the heavier line weight is the proposed ground with a two to one side slope and the lighter line weight is the existing ground. Comparing the proposed and the existing ground, we are able to calculate our earthwork data. We have a cut of almost 3,900 cubic yards, a fill of almost 400 cubic yards, a total road length of 672 feet, and a max longitudinal slope of 14%. Upon reviewing the assembly and profile view of the roadway, we utilized Civil 3D for the access road concept and simulation to the dam site. The left figure depicts an aerial view taken directly from Civil 3D showing dam road access via Eagle Canyon Road, including two turnouts before reaching the dam. The yellow in the figure is the cut that will be made due to the elevations on the hillside. Several trials were done to find the appropriate alignment of the road and minimize the cut and fill. The figure on the right shows a simulation of the driver's point of view when driving on the roadway. In this simulation, we can see the roadway includes one lane two shoulders and a side slope before approaching the dam. I will now introduce the road design specifications for the water tank. As seen to the table to your right, we have a total width of 20 feet, lane width of 16 feet, a shoulder width of two feet, and a cross slope of 2%. An illustration of the, these design specifications just mentioned can be seen to our left. Once we have the assembly ready, we can go ahead and create the profile and cross sections. The above figure depicts the road profile view based on the station versus elevation. The hatch, the hatch line on this profile represents the existing ground surface throughout the alignment of the road center line, while the dark line represents the proposed road profile, which was simpler to meet since the existing ground is pretty shallow. The figure on the bottom left is a cross-sectional example of the road. The existing road line is shown with a small line weight, while the proposed ground is shown with a heavier line weight. With this, we can visualize visualize how the daylight cut needs to be made to the dirt surface for the contractor to construct the access road. The table on the right is the earthwork data given by Civil 3D. We have a cut of 8,232 cubic yards, a fill of 160 cubic yards, a road length of 538 feet, a longitudinal slope of 11%, and a cut and fill layout of 2 to 1. After defining the assembly of the roadway and proposed alignments, Civil 3D's drive mode was utilized to create a first person and aerial views of the proposed roads. The figure on the left illustrates an aerial view of the road with the proposed water tanks and their foundations. This road will be accessible via Eagle Canyon Road. The yellow is the cut required to fulfill the two to one side slopes leading down to the roadway. The figure on the right depicts a first person driving view leading up to the water tanks. In the simulation, we can see the 20 foot lane as the before the side slopes and simulated water tanks. From the created assemblies, we can now move on to drafting an alignment for the profile of the intake tower access road. The top figure illustrates the profile view based on elevations and stations. The heavier line weight represents the proposed ground of the road, while the lighter line weight represents the existing hillside. The figure on the left is a cross-sectional view of the road corridor, again with the darker line weight being the proposed ground and the lighter line weight as the existing hillside. This provides an illustration of the cut and fill that will be needed to match the grading. The earthwork data for the access road requires 1,856 cubic yards of cut, 237 cubic yards of fill, and has a total road length of 243 feet. The profile has a maximum longitudinal slope of 14% and a two to one cut and fill layout. Proposed aerial and driving views can be generated once alignments and slopes are finalized. The figure on the left is an aerial view of the proposed road with the intake tower. The yellow is a required cut needed to meet the stable two to one side slope ratio leading down to the road surface. The road will be accessible via Eagle Canyon Road. The simulation on the right is a first person view which allows us to illustrate the road, the lane, shoulders, slopes, and grading that are gonna be leading down to the intake tower. Now we are going to move on to environmental sustainability, and constructability. 
podcast, I'll be talking about the California Environmental Quality Act, known as CEQA. The environmental factors that I'll be talking about are aesthetics, air quality, biological resource, greenhouse gas emissions, and noise. Aesthetics. Our construction will leave a mark on the land that is not visually pleasing. Air quality. During the construction, there is going to be dust released. There is going to be air pollution from the workers driving and the construction vehicles. Proper air quality checks will be implemented. Our mitigation is that we are going to use water trucks to keep the dust down by keeping the area wet. Biological resource. In the selected construction location, there is an endangered species listed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. It's the Stevens kangaroo rat. The species is important since they promote the growth of plants. There is a total of eight conserved lines for the Stevens kangaroo rat. Lake Matthews, Estella's Mountain Reserve, Patero Reserve, Southern Western Riverside County Multi-Species Reserve, Sycamore Canyon, just to mention some. Greenhouse Gas Emissions There is going to be greenhouse gas emissions from transporting materials from the workers traveling and also from the construction vehicles used. Noise There is going to be an increase on noise during construction but will be monitored to ensure that the noise levels meet regulations. In relation to the American Society of Civil Engineers Envision Checklist, here are a few sustainability projects that will contribute to the implementation of the overall project. A continuous source of energy will be needed for the street lights and pump stations. To be energy efficient, solar lights will be used for street lighting, which will be powered by solar energy. Although discussed but not implemented, the pumps will have been generated by solar energy through solar panels. Also, solar power can be used for the monitoring instrumentation of the dam. Since the project site is within the land boundaries of a multi-jurisdiction conservation plan, it is important to protect the wildlife within the area. First, protective fencing will be positioned around the operational areas. Secondly, the reservoir will attract animals, becoming a new source of water. For some animals, the reservoir may have interrupted a seasonal or daily migration route causing some to attempt to swim across. It is possible for these animals to become trapped and drown in the reservoir. To help prevent this, a fence will be placed in certain areas around the perimeter of the stream. In other areas known as drinking areas, the sides of the slopes will be roughened. Although escape ramps and passageways from one side to the other was discussed, these ideas were not implemented in the design. Protection measures will be detailed in the environmental impact report. And now we'll go over it with the last two sustainability projects that were taken into consideration for the overall project. To start, a bioretention garden. Our bioretention garden will be located at the end of the road and its primary goal will be to capture as much stormwater runoff and later filter into the ground. Due to the low precipitation index in this area, the type of plants used in this garden will require low maintenance and are expected to survive the long dry season. By adding this garden, it will also help us to improve the aesthetics of the dam and will create a nice habitat. Lastly, I would like to talk about the materials used for this project. For our dam, we will try to use as much native soil as possible. With this, we are expecting to reduce the amount of greenhouse gases needed to the atmosphere by minimizing the number of truck trips. This project is constructible, however, necessary measures have to be analyzed in order to accomplish the task. One of the most important things that must be done is having permits to be built to work on the site. What you see below are some of the permits that we will be using for this project. For the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, we will need to comply with Section 401 of the Water Quality Certification, Section 404 of the Clean Water Act, and Section 10 of the Rivers and Harbors Act. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service protect endangered species located in this area, such as the kangaroo rat. With the County of Riverside Transportation Department, we will need to negotiate traffic control permits due to the increase of traffic this project will bring to the area. For the County of Riverside Building and Safety Department, we will need to follow their building code permits. Lastly, to preserve the tribal cultural resources possibly located in this area, we will follow Assembly Bill 52 of the California Environmental Quality Act. In addition to the permits to access the site, we would be using the pre-existing dirt road, Cajalco Canyon, as a temporary construction road. It is located off of Cajalco Road and it gives access to the bottom of the dam as well as access to the pump station, which is located at the same elevation. The image to the left 
demonstrates the road highlighted in yellow, and the bottom of the image to the right, the yellow arrow demonstrates where Cahuaco Canyon meets the project site. Additionally, a stabilized construction access and roadway will be established to minimize the tracking of solids and sediment from the vehicles leaving the construction site. If necessary, street cleaning can be performed to remove track soils, sand, and other debris from public streets. Finally, construction workers have the availability to park on the shoulder of Cahalco Road and at the top of the hill on Eagle Canyon Road, which is demonstrated on the left image. On the right, the red arrow shows an additional parking site closer to the water tank. These locations provide access to both the top and the bottom of the dam, as well as the other projects that are adjacent to it. I will now be moving over our project estimate. Here you can see a spreadsheet of our project estimate. Our project estimate is a class four estimate, meaning that our project design is in the preliminary stage with a five to 30% design completion and holds an accuracy range of plus 40 and minus 20%. Our most notable cost is a dam construction, which consists of 91,450 cubic yards of material, totaling to a total cost of $27,435,000. Other aspects of this estimate is a construction of a combined 0.28 miles of access road, 3,477 lineal feet of 18 inch and 36 inch pipeline systems, a pump station, and two 1.8 million gallon water tanks, an intake structure, and lastly, our estimate for the sustainability aspects of our project. We have applied a 30% contingency, which brings our total construction estimate to $71,611,202, with a design and environmental estimate of $10,741,680, respectively bringing the total project estimate to $93,094,562. I will now be moving forward with our project conclusion. Our team proposes to mitigate the mining company's shrinking water supply by constructing a reservoir with a capacity of 159 million gallons. Our team has shown that our reservoir design will meet the client's demand of 54.75 million gallons per month. Our team's reservoir design will utilize an accessible embankment dam equipped with a spillway and outlay work system. This design will include a water conveyance and storage system consisting of pumps, pipeline system, and two water storage tanks. During the design process, our team made assumptions based off limited available data. Most noteworthy is the limited precipitation data collected from 2012 through 2016 and the assumption that precipitation through the use of the Erzin Dam will maintain or surpass the data collected. Another assumption driving our design is that the geotechnical characteristics of the existing ground located at the Erzin Dam is identical to the data collected from the nearby Lake Matthews outlet facility. Our team has performed geotechnical, structural, and hydrological preliminary designs and calculations along with an environmental analysis showing that our proposed reservoir is not only feasible, but sustainable and constructible. Our team would like to thank you for joining us this afternoon and will now open up the floor for any questions.